Hello guys and welcome back to another video. So today we are going to be messing with the compounds that I have been trying to make for the past month and a half or so. Thank you so much to my 10 plus dollar patrons for their huge donations. So a few months ago I was perusing my discord and I happened to spot these papers that Boom Boom Enthusiasts both suggested and posted for me. And it happened to be the synthesis of the world's most powerful explosive along with others that are very similar in power. So this is where the idea was sparked. So the three compounds I plan to make are shown in these three synthetic pathways. Here's the first one, and this is the dinitramino tetrazole. The second one was the potassium azo salt. And the third one was the just normal potassium bitrazole. Now it took forever to get all the precursors and find all the actual syntheses so I could actually recreate this. And it took around a month for all that. I mean, the project cost me around $500 just for the precursors alone, not including the weeks and weeks and weeks of my time I put into this. So the first compound that I tried to make was potassium 11 dinitramino 55 bis tetrazole. So I first did a condensation reaction with methyl carbazate and glyoxal. Next I take this uh, precursor that we just made and I have to chlorinate it. And after I chlorinate it, I filter and dry it, and then I am now going to replace the chloride groups with azide groups. Next I try to cyclize it in ethereal HCl, but it ends up not working, probably because the azide step didn't really work. Since this synthesis took around a week, I decided to give up and not waste any more of my valuable precursors or time. This next compound had the least amount of steps and was pretty easy to make after I figured out how to make the cyanogenazide. God, cyanogenazide. That compound just gives me a headache whenever I think about it. It took me around a month to figure it out, and the only reason I figured it out is because somebody sent me a paper. I honestly don't remember who it was, but thank you so much to that person. And it turns out I just had to use a bunch of excess sodium azide, which is kind of stupid. Nonetheless, I did figure it out eventually, so thanks to a lot of people helping me out. But, um, yeah, so essentially you just mix methyl carbazate and cyanogen azide, and you get this nice white precipitate that you filter and dry, and then that precipitate, you just directly nitrate it. Now you guys may be thinking, oh, nitration, easy. No, that is where you're wrong. For this nitration, you have to use dinitrogen pentoxide and not nitric acid, because this compound is very, very picky. So we just nitrate for an hour at zero Celsius, then we douse it with potassium hydroxide. Now this is where a huge, massive problem comes in that screws up absolutely everything, which is my potassium hydroxide, but I'll get into that later. Now I just let it crystallize out, and I freebase it, and I get my pure crystals. Now the last explosive that we're going to make is potassium 11 dinitramino 55 azo bitrazole, and this is essentially the first one that I tried to make, but with an azo bridge instead of no azo bridge. So this one is going to be significantly more powerful and, you know, unstable due to that azo bridge. This reaction uses the same precursor of the methyl carbazate plus the cyanogen azide. So after we initially get all that, I mass produced it so that I could make enough. I, um, all I did was oxidize it in solution with potassium permanganate to form the azo bridge. After purifying and filtering, I get this really nice orange powder and I directly nitrate that with, again, dinitrogen pentoxide, because this is another one of those picky compounds that have to be selectively nitrated. Now, just like we did with the last one, I douse it with KOH to neutralize everything, but there were a few problems with this. Again, it was the bad KOH, which I'll again go over later, and the problem was I didn't use enough KOH, so I ended up uh, actually making the solution still acidic, which leads to a massive issue. The issue is that the potassium salt is formed, but the free base is also being formed since it's still acidic. Now, the free base is one of the most, actually, it might be the most sensitive compound I've ever worked with, and actually exploded under its own weight inside the vacuum chamber when drying, which destroyed the beaker. That second beaker is just sodium carbonate to neutralize any acidic vapor, but the other beaker, as you can see, is completely shattered. The only reason why the other one didn't break is because there couldn't be a, like, a shockwave through a vacuum. So I guess the vacuum kind of did save my other beaker. Also, the free base of this compound is the most powerful explosive uh, so far created. So that also, you know, helped rip my beaker to shreds. 
However, I did manage to successfully get the potassium salt, and I can officially say that I have broken my 10,000 meters a second detonation velocity virginity. Okay, so now let's get to the actual explosions, now that I got all that out of the way. So, the first thing I'm going to do is turn the free-based dinitramino tetrazole into the potassium salt. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because the potassium salt is actually more powerful than the free-base, which is kind of really rare, actually. You never see that. So here is a table of the detonation velocities, and we're going to be doing compound 1 and compound 5. So compound 1 is the free base, and 5 is the potassium salt, and you can see that there is a very slight difference in the detonation velocity. However, you can see the huge difference in kilobar, which is the barissance of the explosive. So making it is very simple. I just drip methanolic KOH into methanolic of the free base, and it comes out as this fluffy white precipitate. Now this is a huge red flag, and the reason why this KOH is horrible. This compound is supposed to have a density of around 2.14, I think, and you can see that it's not even perfectly white. So I filtered it and dried it completely, and I tested 50 milligrams of it, and I'd noticed that it was extremely light and fluffy. So I was kind of eager to see what the explosion would look like. Yeah, something's wrong. So, now I'm going to test the other potassium salt that I made with this, the azobitrazole, and see if it also acts very strangely. Yeah, so something is very wrong, and the only way to fix up the potassium salts is to freebase them, and then turn them back into their potassium salt using a more pure potassium hydroxide that I ordered in the mail. So it wasn't that hard to freebase them, but I did run into a slight issue with the uh, potassium azobitrazole. I might or might not have spilled the entire thing and lost all my product. So now the only soldier left was the potassium dinitraminotetrazole, which I made the exact same way except this time. If you look very carefully, you can see how dense it is. You can see that it's not all fluffy and that when I swish it around, it instantly settles to the bottom. It's kind of hard to see at the side angle, but the top, you can, at least in person, you could easily see how it was way different. You can kind of see on camera, though, how it all just settles down instantly. Okay, so now I do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to do a 50 milligram test, but with this potassium dinitramino tetrazole. Okay, yep, that definitely worked, and confirmed my belief of the uh, potassium hydroxide being horrible. 99% my ass. Yeet! Now it still doesn't seem to be at its full power, but I'll explain that later. Now we're going to do the indirect and direct flame test. As you can see, the direct flame test actually leads to more burning than detonating, but the indirect flame leads to a lot of detonation. Here's more of it, uh, not really detonating when you touch it, but it does detonate when you heat from under. So now let's test the uh, impact and friction sensitivity. The paper says that it's pretty high, but I... For some reason, mine was not that high. I think that mine was a little wet, because it definitely should have been higher. So for the final test of this potassium salt, we're going to scale it all the way up into 100 milligrams. So now I want to test the free base of this compound, because it's supposed to be about the same. Look at that, it's acting like a high explosive. The free base didn't even explode with indirect heat. And direct heat? Nothing at all, exact same thing. Well, that was kind of weird, so I decided to do a hammer test, and apparently this stuff is very sensitive, so it should go off pretty easily, so let's try it. 
Jesus Christ. So here's just to show you how dense it is. That's 50 milligrams, tiny, tiny amount. Now this test is a little wonky because I did leave it out for a day and this stuff is actually very hydroscopic. So it is actually very wet at the moment. However, it didn't seem to affect it too much, although I'm sure it definitely lowered its power a little. On another note, I did try to make the silver and copper compounds of the dinitramino tetrazole, but they didn't really work very well, so I just cut those out of the video. Okay, so now to compare cans, on the left is the potassium dinitramino tetrazole, and on the right is the freebase dinitramino tetrazole. You can see that the freebase is actually way more powerful and did a lot more damage. Now, the reasoning behind this, that I believe, is that the freebase was in its crystalline form. It was very, very dense, while the potassium one had two problems with it. First of all, it was in a very fluffy powder after it dried, because it got all fluffy when it dried, and um, it really... It was probably very impure, because I don't think I really washed out the excess potassium hydroxide, because I used a lot of excess, just to be sure that the freebase was gone. So yeah, I'm a little mad at myself that I didn't wash the potassium dinitramino tetrazole thoroughly, because that definitely screwed it up a little. But this is the 100 milligram can, as you can see. Huge hole, not very many exit holes, but you can see a bunch of the shrapnel, tiny pieces of aluminum foil at the bottom. Now, the reasoning for this is because they couldn't go out the back because the can flew backwards, which kind of dampened all the power. So you really don't see any exit holes there. If I kept it standing up straight or, you know, not able to move, it definitely would have ripped a ton of holes in the back, maybe even a massive hole. Now the can that I'm showing right now is a 300 milligram DDNP charge, which I loaded into a bullet shell. So that's a little bit unfair because, uh, you know, shrapnel of brass going through, but uh, comparing the size, you can see that they are roughly the same, which is funny because one's 100 milligrams and one's 300 milligrams. So now I'm going to compare the potassium dinitramino tetrazole with everything else. So there it is with the free base 50 milligrams. Both had 50 milligrams that time. Here is the 50 milligram one versus the 100 milligram one. You can see that it's about half the size. And here's comparing the free base with the 100 milligram. So you can see that the 50 milligram free base was well over half the size of the 100 milligram uh, potassium salt. Thank you everybody so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it because this took me multiple months to uh, make everything, synthesize everything, and you know edit it all down. So I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys have any questions, I would love to hear them in the comments because I did go over a lot and there is some information that I had to leave out for time's sake. So if anything you aren't really sure on, just ask in the comments and I'll try to clarify it for you. Okay, I'm getting pretty close to 1k subs and most people don't make it this far in the video so I'm just going to say this. I'm probably going to do a face reveal when I hit 1k and make a special compound and I would love to hear your ideas on this compound.